Thursday. That means that it's the Red Zone. We're ready to rock and roll right now with our fifth, our fifth superintendent round table right now. Josh Novart, Park Principal of Memorial Pathway Academy in Garland ISD, Garland USA. Ready to rock and roll with. Look at this leadership from all over the United States. Ready to boom, drop the mic, drop that knowledge, but most importantly, making sure that we're all in it together because it doesn't matter where you are, whether you're in Alaska, whether you're in Hawaii, whether you're in Maine, whether you're in Florida, or anywhere in the 48 middle, we're all on the same mis mission. Student success. All, as I, as I know somebody, all means all. So it doesn't matter where, all means all. What do you think about that, Dean Packard in Massachusetts? <laughs> I think we own every child that walks through our doors. And I love that you just said that, Josh. Hi, everybody. I'm Dean Packard, one of the co-founders of Unlock the Middle and super psyched here tonight to be here with a superintendent roundtable once again. You know, Josh, and uh, in, in the, from the lens of leadership, and you and I have been doing this a long time. I've got over 20 years in a leadership position, and we do it because we're servant leaders, and we love to empower people around us and just make everybody a little bit better by giving them the opportunity to, to grow. And that's what it's all about. And, you know, tonight, we're going to be talking about uh, talking with a panel of individuals who, who run their own districts. And you think about that for a second, how important that is to be able to look at the people who work collaterally with you and also in, in the transitional areas and make them better. Because that's what leadership is all about. And it's great to have you all here with us tonight. So first and foremost, again, um, hope you're all well. Uh, Thursday nights are all about 20 minutes of just getting a little bit better together. So I want to kick it back to you, Josh. Well, go ahead. No, did I say 20 minutes? minutes? Yeah, I, what did I, what did I screw up Tuesday night and sir? Thursday night? Is the age kicking in, sir? Sir? Full disclosure. I just went outside in? to do something. I stepped on something in my foot. And I didn't oh, tell you Lord. It was up in the air, so it must have gone right to my brain. Sorry, amigo. Take, so the banter is no longer amongst the principals. The banter right now, the old principals, it's about the awesome view from on top, looking at the whole mm -hmm. picture. Community, parents, kids, state, everything comes at that chair. Now, that is a very hot chair. But you know what? Let's make sure that we go around real quick right now, Dean Packard, and just do a quick name and where you're located, and then Dean will take it away. Just name and where you're located. Let's start off in California. Let's go. Hello, everyone. I am Xander Galvan, the proud superintendent of the Greenfield Union School District on the central coast of California in Monterey County. Uh, right in the middle of California. Well, welcome to the show, and we're glad Thank you're with you. us tonight. Thanks Neil, you're up. Sure. Um, good evening, everybody. I am honored. Uh, my name is Neil Gupta. Um, I get to serve as uh, currently the uh, Director of Secondary Education for Worthington Schools. It's a suburb of Columbus, Ohio, um, and I was named uh, back in February to Oakwood School District uh, right there uh, as the incoming superintendent. Um, it's a suburb of Dayton, Ohio. So I'm excited. This will be my first superintendency and um, I'm, I'm really excited for it. And so I'm honored. This is the first time I've actually been on a superintendent uh, meeting right here. That's awesome. So thank you. Well, we all, we're all better at this because of COVID. So this is a good thing right now. That's a positive. Glenn, you're up. All right, following two rock stars. Uh, Glenn Robbins, proud superintendent from Brigantine, New Jersey. Brigantine, New Jersey is located in southern New Jersey. My school district is located three blocks from the beach. So I don't know if it gets any better than that, people. It doesn't get any better than that. Hey, Glenn, let's go backwards now. We'll do the same thing we just did. Talk about your rise to where you are today. Talk about being a teacher, maybe going up the ladder administratively to get to being a superintendent. Uh, and plus all the multiple failures along the way. Right? <laughs> yeah, so, humble. Yeah. I love that. That's yeah, why so we're just good. learning one step at a way. But yeah, teacher uh, at the history level of uh, high school, soccer coach, then worked up to VP. Um, I was 27 when I started that as vice principal and then jumped into principalship for a couple of years. Very successful there. And then jumped into superintendency in one district. And now I'm in Brigantine and hope to be there for quite some time. Been there for the last three years. But uh very blessed, but a lot of hard work went into all those years, and I was far from perfect and still am far from perfect. I love that you mentioned about failures because, you know, you can't, if you're not going to ever succeed until you fail at a few things because that means you step out of your comfort zone. Great job, man. Good stuff right there. Neil? Yeah, so started as a high school math teacher. Um, thought I was going to be doing that for life um, in the hometown where I grew up. I'm very happy for that, but I, I'm going to um, – I'm going to give a big shout out to uh, my school district. At the time, they had had an ex external audit um, come in to go over a number of things of how they could get better. And one place they got dinged was the idea of succession planning, that they that they were they were growing some of the best, 
but they were leaving then the district and they weren't kind of growing in and keeping. Um, so early on, I, I, I'm going to say that sometimes it's all about chance and timing was the district um, put their faith in me and um, put me in some leadership roles early in my career. And uh, through that track, I became assistant principal, district office administrator in that same district, wanted to stay there for life. Uh, but then you get the phone call, right? You get the phone call to come and have a conversation with somebody. And so more opportunity um, with diverse experiences led me to another district and led me to another district and now leads me to another district. So looking forward to it. Love that. You just keep growing, man. That's good stuff right there. Sandra. All right. So non, a non-traditional pathway for me. And so anyone who's listening that are aspiring superintendents, there is no perfect pathway to the seat. There's so many different opportunities around. And it really has to do with your experience in the seat that you hold and what you um, are willing to learn more about. And so my very non-traditional pathway to the superintendency uh, grew up right in Greenfield. I'm the proud superintendent of the place that I grew up, was a five-year-old, entered my school system, was here for 17 years as a classroom teacher. Yes, I am a kindergarten teacher. If you can hear me, touch your nose. You can hear me, touch your ear. Works with everyone, right? So I started in kindergarten, third grade, did some middle school, then went into the academic coaching for a bit. And kind of similar to my brother, Neil, um, got kind of plucked up by some of those people that came through during those program improvement days and said, hmm, you got a little bit of secret sauce there in your classroom. Will you come work for us and go do consulting um, across California and like help teachers uh, become improved, uh, you know, program improvement days. And so I did that for a little bit while I was teaching and coaching and got discovered by another district that I was training in. And they said, hey, we have a director of curriculum and instruction seat open. Would you like to apply for it? And I said, heck no. Why would I want to do that? I'm like so happy uh, living the dream, being close to kids. Um, and so they just kind of convinced me to apply. Needless to say, I got that job, central office, uh, did that, promoted to associate superintendent of ed services, all thing ed services, and did that for 10 years. 10 years. I ran all the budgets, the, every single program you can name, English learners, uh, migrant, all the teacher induction. We lost a CBO. I jumped in and helped with categorical programming, budgets, all that kind of things. So learned a lot in that seat for 10 years. And then now I've been sitting in this seat as the superintendent, came back and applied um, to Greenfield for this position and been here uh, completing six years now. So yeah, so any tradition, like there is no traditional pathway. You just got to take it and be willing to learn. And I completely agree with my brother, Glenn. Um, yes, stay humble, always be hungry to learn more. None of us are perfect in the roles that we do. And every day is a lear an opportunity to learn from, um, from others. And I love hanging around people that are smarter than me because I grow and I learn every day. And just this morning, I was hanging out with both Glenn and Neil. And we were talking all about AI and the future of education and just brilliant minds in a space. And so um, I love that. Xandra, something tells me that you are not far from kids, though. I bet you find those pockets of opportunities to ensure you get that little bit of juice back. So I love that stuff. Great story. And I can see it in your smile. OK, amigo, take over. So we all have that person that inspires us. We all have that person at the early stages of our career. We have that role model. So, Glenn, talk to us. Who was your role model in education? And after you answer that, who you, who's your role model in education? What was the event that said, yeah, I want the main chair? There's an event that says, you know what, I want that main chair. What was it? So who's your role model in education? Who brought up that fuego, las ganas, for education? <laughs> and what was the event that said, you know what, I'm going to put in my name to be a superintendent? I love how he drops the question right on me right away. So I actually have a about two of them to be honest with you two that really inspired me one uh is like neil and zondra said when you come up through the ranks i had one who was an assistant principal um i thought the water of him peter brandt he's a principal over at uh, lindenboard high school now in new jersey but he walked the talk and he did everything he was very admirable people looked up to him when he spoke he listened um and he was willing to help you out in every single way i dedicated my lunch my prep and every other hour i could get to being with him and then when I worked up through the ranks, I, you know, I kept seeing how Peter was and what great things he was doing and how he was helping me grow. Like I said, I started at 27 as a vice principal. I was quite, quite young, uh, doing tons of disciplinary and work and so forth. And then by 30, I was the most senior member probably in the district his administration, which is kind of scary uh, for a massive district. But um, the one that really got me over the ledge to, to be, become the leader that I've become 
uh, would be Bob Gargiulo. Uh, Bob was an interim superintendent when I was a principal at Northfield in New Jersey. And I said, you know, for two years before I had another superintendent and Bob comes in, I said, Bob, what do you need me to do? I've been helping out my father, assistant superintendent, uh, you know, throughout this time. I just started. He goes, just be you. Run the district the way you want to run it. And after that, you know, I, it, the sky was a limit. I was blessed to have numerous national accolades after that. I started meeting all these great people. And I'll never forget, Bob would always dress down. And it was always like, relax. So when Bob dressed up, people were like, did someone die? Like, do, were you going to a funeral? So Bob prompted me, and I'll never forget, he called me down. He kept telling me to dress down, dress down. He said I was going to write me up for insubordination if I didn't. And I finally did, and I wore jeans because I was always a suit and tie guy. And he called me down to the cafeteria. There's a massive fight. There's a massive fight. You got to get down here. I'm like, this never happened. So I go running down, and the whole cafeteria is cheering for me, you know, because I wore jeans that day. And Bob, like I said, inspired me to be totally different. So now, as Zandra and Neil and you guys know, if you watch me and follow me, I wear all kinds of wacky outfits because it's all for the kids. It's all for the smiles. You follow them more. I got a wacky outfit again tomorrow coming out because uh, it's field day. But it made me be at heart with the kids. It made me be me. It made me feel, you know, a self-esteem, no more imposter syndrome, none of that. It's, hey, be you, be the best you can be for kids, like you gentlemen said at the very beginning. And like Zandra says all the time, all means all. So I'm uh, blessed to have those two amazing individuals on top of many others I did not mention. So beyond thankful to have them. Appreciate the words. Neil. Yeah. So I think it's the same thing like Glenn. It's, it's a journey, right? I don't know if there was any epiphany moment. There was no movie theater moment where the music crescendos and all of a sudden you see this like, you know, light that kind of comes through. Um, I would say for me, I, going into education uh, was, was my high school counselor, not because he was my high school counselor, but um, that's the title he had but uh, he was my best friend's uh, dad. And so I was growing up in the house, mooching in their, off their food, hanging out at their house. It was the cool house to hang in. And you just got to see not just what he did during the day, but, but the guy walked the walk on a Friday night and a Saturday afternoon. And I, I just really came to appreciate um, how, how enthusiastic he was about kids constantly. Like, I, you know, people I think have a day job and then they have a weekend job and it's their persona is different and they have whatever, but he had a passion for students and a passion for leadership that was 365. And, and that's what was really appealing and, and inspiring to me. And so even when I said I was a high school math teacher, it wasn't really math that drove me. You know, I, I'm not geeked out about math. Um, it's more about, it was, a, it was a great way for me to connect with kids. Um, I, so I, I, when I talk about becoming a superintendent, you know, I think because of all those moves that I made, I don't, I can't say that it was um, I, I was waiting for the right timing uh, of uh, doing that. When, you're, when my kids were young, it, I didn't want to put myself in that role. We had already made some two major moves uh, physically, and um, I didn't want to disrupt that. And so there was a little bit of waiting that happened um, over the past eight years when my kids kind of matriculated through uh, high school and uh, middle school. And, um, but it, it, it was my, my super current superintendent, uh, Dr. Trent Bowers, that, that – um, you know, I think this gave me this this confidence of you don't have to um, be everything. You don't have to 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 know everything. You don't have to. And it's not that he's not wicked smart. Not that he's an, not an awesome leader. But it's all about distributive leadership. I got to just really watch him about and understand that. You know, how does he as he's thinking about one piece of the puzzle? Is he thinking about other people and the potential impact that's going to take place? Because I think we're sometimes we we see people make mistakes. Where we've all made mistakes is. We sometimes we, we, we think that um, a decision is binary and it has, um, you know, you make you pull a lever and uh, yes, no or whatever. And, it, and there's an impact, you know, one to one. Whereas I love how he would sit back and kind of take a look and see how does it impact a, a decision that happens maybe at the high school? Does it impact middle school, elementary? How does it maybe impact um, not just the teaching staff, but the classified staff? How does it impact parents? How does it impact different subgroups of kids, not just one group of kids. And so over time, watching him kind of go through those things, I would say gave me the confidence in, in the ability to understand that I don't have to know everything, that I don't have to 
to, to put that on my shoulders. Um, but th this is going to happen from, you know, the collective part. And I think the beautiful thing is, is already this vulnerability of, I haven't physically stepped foot in this new district that I'm going to. And I already have so much appreciation for the leadership team in the community. And I haven't even stepped foot there yet, but how gracious they've been, how smart they are, um, how caring they are for kids um, only just makes it that much more exciting. Awesome. Thank you for those words, Neil. Zandra. So good. You guys are so good. Look at this. Um, so who inspires me? Well, I'll tell you, I'm the baby of six. Babies are a little extra, right? Mm -hmm. And there's nine years between me and the five. I know. So I'm like really a baby. So inspiration is always family for me. And so my big sister, the oldest, who's 16 years older than me, was a teacher on my campus when I was a fifth grader. And she was a first year teacher when I was in fifth grade. And she inspired me to be want to become a teacher. And here's what happened. I was a fifth grader. Rather than playing with my buddies, who I totally would do that, I'd grab a couple friends and we'd go down to her classroom and we'd read to kindergartners during lunchtime. And there was just this magic secret sauce in being in front of kids, like just secret sauce in teaching. That was just so magical that absolutely, I think what you said, Dean and Josh too, that's why I'm in classrooms every morning because I wanna be as close to kids and do things with them and read with them and ask them questions and just hang out um, because there's something magical about the classroom and how that keeps us grounded as leaders and inspires us to do the good work and to make sure that we never take the seat for granted, that we know that this job is something that can be just swoop from under us in any given moment if a board decides that they don't like you anymore or they don't want you to be there anymore. Um, as we've seen across the nation with some really awesome brothers and sisters superintendents that are no longer in the superintendent seat for various reasons. Um, but the inspiration comes from my sister, my family, in wanting to do some really great things in the classroom. And then I remember, you know, just being a baby, it's a little extra with the confidence. And they were this, they wrote, they raised me together with my parents to just go out there and, and be confident, but to be kind and to make sure that what we do in this world is passion filled and mission driven and kind, really kind to people. And I'm also um, my family, not me, I'm a Cali girl, you know, born and raised, but they're all from West Texas. They're all born and raised in the Bible Belt right there in Snyder, Texas. Um, and just good, kind-hearted people with Christian beliefs. We're all for Southern Baptists. I'm Latina. That is not Catholic, as most of us are in this area. Um, but we're for Southern Baptists. And it's those installation of the inspiration from being part of a church community, but also being part of just really grounded people in with that sense of belonging and making sure that we support others in, in, in that inspiration. Um, and so one thing that I think um, Glenn mentioned too, is just being ourselves um, and how important that is uh, for a Latina. Uh, I'm in, I mean, I do cross into some intersectionality as a female superintendent, very few of us, right, across the nation. Statistics are startling when it comes to 20%, um, all the way down to 4% of women of color in the superintendent seat. And so we do talks often about how do we talk up and help support aspiring um, superintendents and have the honor, um, as um, many of you probably do also to mentor and to support the next generation. And that gives me inspiration too, to know that when we're out, you know, and we retire, that this next generation is going to be so willing and ready uh, to take on that challenge. So many things inspire me, but those are just a few. That's like the greatest gift you can think about the legacy, what you leave behind and how you can bring people along and empower them to get to the seat. Great stuff. You guys all have great stories. Hey, let's circle back for a second. Let's look at 2023, 2022, 23, 23, 24. Let's talk about some of your greatest celebrations from 22, 23. And let's talk about you know, like one thing there, then one thing you're really looking forward to doing in 23 and 24, that's going to move the needle. I still say coming out of post COVID time period, we are still helping kids become regulated and learning to learn. We are helping our teachers to be to be happy, to enjoy their vocation. We're trying to empower them, but we're also trying to make sure that we keep the ship going in the same direction. And it's very difficult sometimes. So let's go this way. Let's start off with Neil. Talk about something 22-23 that you are very proud of and now 23-24 what you want to dig into. Great. Okay. So 
So I'm gonna put like a, a, a foot in each district, I guess, for that. So um, in, in the current district for 22, 23, um, I think what I'm most, um, I guess, excited about and, and also like leaving, like, you know, am I leaving the district better than where I found it sort of thing. And what I most appreciate again, and I think this is because of our district is um, in the state of Ohio, we've got new graduation requirements, um, but um, it's not just knowing what the new requirements are, but putting things in place, but, you know, really thinking about the idea of um, making sure our students ready for what's beyond. And I think sometimes, you know, I can chase, um, creating more opportunities for those top level tier kids, um, but really looking for what were the students that, that um, may financially or, or may not be thinking about that they're four year or two year college bound. So pre-apprenticeship uh, programs that have come in place. So strengthening some pre-apprenticeship programs with some partners that we have in our, our Columbus area. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, it feels kind of like that, that um, starfish analogy because there's, a, there's so much work that has to happen to, to allow a student to go and work in um, a manufacturing plant, for example, transportation, liability, credits, um, all kinds of paperwork that needs to happen. And you're kind of like, you did all this work and did it make a difference? And, you know, you find out that, you know, four, four kids participated and you, you, you could sit behind a desk and say, gosh, all that work and four kids, is it worth it? I, I actually had a conversation with somebody about that. Um, but you know, it's the right thing to do. So you continue doing it. Um, but, and not that we should always do it for those moments, but I did get a chance to talk with those students at the end of that semester. And they just said how, how, like, they feel like now they're on this pathway. The parents came to me and said, wow, we've seen a difference in our student. And that motivation helps, you know, because it's not like sometimes you're going to get those grandiose thousand student, you know, thing that's going to happen that's going to, you know, move the needle, um, but it's going to happen that one by one. And, and so I'm, I'm appreciative that, you know, we've built four partners and we've also got a process in place, I think, for the next person to be able to build more as we go into the future. Um, as far as getting ready for next year, um, and I think, you know, Xander touched upon this, is um, I'm moving from a 10,000 student district to a 2,000 student district. And I'm, so I'm not, I'm not naive that there won't be difficult parts to um, going into the role of superintendency, but I'm really hoping that, that um, this, this idea of a little bit smaller and tight-knit community is gonna give me the ability to connect with students. And I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and so I wanna, my, my hope and goal is to uh, create opportunities to um, foster two-way communication and voice of our students and especially our marginalized students um, and, and give them a place. And um, I, I, I wanna do those in formal and informal ways. Like I, I want to, I'm looking forward to going and eating lunch with them in the cafeteria and, and informally, you know, being a part of that process, but then formal mechanisms of um, making sure I've got um, some different forms and, and things put in place. There, there are people that are too, you know, I can't use the idea of the, the breakfast club analogy, but the breakfast club movie and as far as picking, again, those marginalized students, not just kind of thinking about um, oh, picking student council students to, to just be the ones that we're gonna talk to, but making sure that each uh, student group is represented. And with, with 2000 students, um, it's game on. I gotta figure out how to connect with all of them. That's gonna be my goal. Great stuff right there. Sandra. Totally agree. I'm so excited for you. I didn't realize, I, I never pay attention to size of districts because all the work that we have to do is the same when it comes to whether you're a large district or not. Um, relationships matter, no matter the size of a district. Um, people matter, no matter the size of a district. And those human connections are so important. So I'm super excited for you. Absolutely everything that you shared is gonna happen. Um, that's the beautiful thing. So my district is 3,700 kids. Um, and I get to know, like every single teacher, when I walk into those classrooms, you get to know them um, and the kids and they remember you. Like they remember you and the impact you make. So some of my greatest um, accomplishments, going back to your question, Dean, so I'm super excited for you, Neil. I just want to close that container and just tell you I'm, I'm so happy. And I'm always here for you, like all of us. And that's the beautiful thing. And I think you touched on this earlier. Um, there is a camaraderie around superintendents in this moment more than ever before. Um, and I remember not even knowing who a superintendent was when I was a teacher, I remember as a kid, for sure, I didn't know who they were. I didn't ever see them. As a teacher, sometimes they came into our classroom, right? As a teacher. And then as a parent, heck no, I didn't even know, you know, like all those kinds of things. But the ability now, even, and I probably was birthed out of the pandemic where we all just had to struggle through some really heavy challenges that we reached out to each other so much. 
And so I think the um, the camaraderie that exists within the superintendent seat, which is why I'm so confident and comfortable saying brothers and sisters, like that's how I see another superintendent who's aspiring or already in the seat um, because of the work that we have to lead together. And we want like your win is my win. My win is your win and whatever we can share. Um, so I just wanted to say that because I'm super excited for you. Super excited. Um, but going back to your question about the greatest accomplishments, gosh, I've been here going into my seventh year and what a journey it has been. Um, I remember coming into a district and inheriting a district that, um, you know, had just some challenges, some very serious challenges that we had to overcome. Um, and some of the things that we put into place I'm really proud of that still exist today um, are like essential standards mapping, a common, a common guaranteed viable curriculum, um, looking at the PLCs that we have, the professional learning communities, we went on a solution tree journey and just took buses of people on airplanes to go to conferences together to break bread and to learn about um, how to you know, attack those four essential questions. We designed common assessments that we didn't have before to measure student progress on their journey to making uh, meeting proficiency. We also really built up the culture. Like this behind me, that this the, we rebranded our whole district in our journey because like I said, I inherited a place where people weren't feeling very happy. And my teacher turnover was like 60 to 80 teachers every year I would lose and have to fill. Yeah, because they were getting low pay at that time because we were um, a district that um, couldn't give raises because we had too many extra positions. So you also have to go on a listening campaign and a learning campaign and realizing, wait, we have this many positions for this many students. That doesn't really make sense. That's where our money's going. So we had to do desk audits and things like that. So I'm you know, proud of the journey that we went on together with our school board, but also finding solutions to things. So anyone that was displaced or positions that were unfilled, we found you know, a, a place for them in another, in another area if we could. Um, so those kinds of things, but all of the lessons learned and the district we have today is a very different district than before. I just got off of, and I meet with my labor partners. Um, California is a big, heavy labor state. Um, CT, California Teachers Association, as well as our classified association are two of the largest, and um, they do have a lot of power behind them. And so one of our other greatest accomplishments is meeting with them. I meet with them um, when uh, prior to the pandemic, it was once a month. During the pandemic, it was every single week. Post pandemic, it's every other week till now they're like, you know what, let's just meet once a month. Greatest compliment ever is when a, uh, the union tells the superintendent, you are the first superintendent in the history that we've been here that we trust. That's huge. And they said, our relationship is so collaborative that we are just so grateful for this. And the feeling is mutual. Like we are so grateful to them. When we settle and we had to you know, reach agreements, we settled rather quickly because we're very transparent and honest in what we do. And so that to me is the greatest accomplishment. And the final one is probably just walking through classrooms and seeing the bright eyes um, and the bushy tails on our kids, just so excited about things that are happening um, within their school classes. They're so happy to be back. Their teachers are just gems. And yeah, it's just the kids, the, the eyes of our kids is what makes me so happy. And that's an accomplishment in itself because what we do and we put in front of them matters and we don't take that lightly. That's great excitement right there from both of you guys. That's fantastic. Uh, I think Glenn has just stepped out for a moment. So if we want to just continue on, we'll try to get him in when he pops in. So Sandra, you know that right now we have a huge demand with our team members in the classroom. We can't find to enough individuals to fill in the gaps. Doesn't matter from where, from bus drivers to cross guards, everywhere. So what are you doing in your sphere of influence to address this teacher educator? Because it's all of them, educator uh, shortage. So I do have a solution. I'll tell you that right now. You ready? Buckle up, buttercups. So here's what it is. Articulation with your local community college and universities. Here's what we have right here in Monterey County, in my Salinas Valley, local here. I'm able to home grow talent. And so rather than wait for teachers to come to us, we create those teachers here. So in our high schools, we have um, the teacher pathway. And so one of those elective courses is um, education. And so they first get a taste of it. They come and they tutor. They they get a taste of what's happening in our local classrooms. Um, and again, I'm an elementary district. And so we, we host uh, teachers often. Um, and then what happens is they go into our community college and it's called the Teacher Pathway Program. And what has happened is our local community college, 
articulates to our local university. So Hartnell Community College articulates the California State University Monterey Bay, and it is a two year here. And guess what they do? They bring the program to Greenfield. They bring the classes to our local um, communities and our local teachers are then able to go to those classes. Then they articulate to the university. And again, those classes are here for them to take them. So you don't even have to leave and drive an hour and a half away or an hour away, the classes are here. And so that's a beautiful thing. And every year we're hiring at least 20 to 30 teachers out of those cohorts. That's a beautiful thing. And it's not, and I didn't realize it was a unique experience. Like not everyone has it in every community, but it's a super simple of getting the people at the table, getting the local districts at the table, getting your community college to design that offer those classes, design the cohorts and the university. Um, and to be able to see that, another thing that I will tell you, a challenge for us is um, indigenous populations and be able to, to speak indigenous languages. So here in, um, in my valley, we are a 95% unduplicated count of students in poverty because most of the families work in the fields. They feed the nation. So they're working in the lettuce fields, they're working in the grape fields and the, and the strawberries, broccoli, all that. And so um, many of them come from the state of Mexico. And not only Spanish is their native language, it's also um, Triqui, Zapoteco, and Mixteco, which are indigenous to the Oaxacan um, state in Mexico. So to have parents come in and not be able to talk that language, the beauty of growing your own is that we hire teachers who can speak the native languages. And to have a parent walk in and say, whoa, you speak Triqui? Whoa, I don't understand it. Nobody else understand it, but they speak the language. So that's how we're kind of addressing the, um, the teacher shortage right here in our community. We call that universal design right there. You are meeting them where they're at. Good work. Yeah. Love it. Glenn, how are you addressing in your sphere of influence the, the educator shortage? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. We have a great collaboration with the university near us. Uh, we have two, actually, uh, two of them, actually. Um, and we've been pretty blessed on that, to be honest with you. Um, I put out a recent... Uh, two or three positions, and we had over 50 applications for each one. So uh, we've been very fortunate. Now, like I said, we work by the beach. Um, I know I got kicked off on technology issues. I'm back on the phone. Uh, but I did hear some of the things that we're talking about, but some great things going on in the district. For us, we don't have a teacher turnover. Um, you know, we're one of the best paying in the in the state because uh, we believe in our staff and the people know that we had a culture climate that was built. Uh, we use human ventures and, you know, our first year we did it, we was at 76 uh, percent, uh, which basically said how happy the staff was. Um, that was right after our COVID year. And this year they're at 82 percent. The average school district is 60 percent right now, if not lower, because of the frustration, the burnout, the, you know, the administrative changes, the board craziness and all that. So we've been very blessed in that regard that we truly invest and believe in our teachers so people want to be there and like i said we we work and live near the beach so we create a great opportunity for them we have a great relationship with the two universities of bringing non-stop teachers uh you know pre-service pre-service teachers to our district and then they don't want to leave um so you know people want to come into our district for all the great reasons and uh like i said we treat them like they are the best because that's truly how i feel um so, yeah, I hope that answers your question. We're not as complex as Zondra's going on. But, uh, we do have, we're very blessed in what we have going on right now. Neil? Yeah, so, so the current district that I'm in and, and then future districts um, do, do not have a, um, a worry about uh, teacher shortage. Um, I, I, will, I will say, though, a couple things of um, where I think we have to be all cognizant of, you know, cr across the nation regardless is, you know, what is the narrative of education and, you know, educators and, and uh, what's going on right now. And, you know, people, I know individually have personal reasons why they're, you know, that, that great resignation of why they're, why they're leaving. Um, but I think that we, and I, I'm, I'm sure Sandra Glenn, Glenn and I have this, you know, um, in our hearts, you know, as far as, you know, how do we, how we're ambassadors, how we've got to be cheerleaders, how we've got to help carry that. Sandra said, it's, you know, she, lit a fire in me of like, you know, my job has to be uplifting. It can't just be like, Hey, I'm walking, running in like, you know, the shining night sort of thing to go save the kids. Uh, there's no, there's not a capacity for that to happen. It's how do we, how do we help uplift our teachers and how do we help be positive them for them? Um, 
I don't, I don't know if it's always that we'll be able to throw money at it because I don't even know if money is always the issue. It, they may say that that's the issue, but I don't even think that that's always the issue. Um, I, I think it's things like, and again, I'm taking, I'm, I'm, I'm summarizing Xander. Are, are we being transparent in our, in how we make decisions? Are we listening? And, and then are we collaborating or things that are going to be the hallmarks of, you know, how, pe how people feel in that moment in time, you know, again, nobody's going to be able to give anybody else the keys to the, you know, Mercedes or nobody's going to get, the, you know, to take the private jet in, in you know, in, like they do in the private industry sometimes. But what we can do is be that listening ear um, and, and provide that empathy and, and try to have the, that clear, steady answer. Um, even sometimes if they're not able to like what the answer is, at least they can feel supported that there was time that was given towards that. So that's kind of in my, in my head and heart. One thing that I do know I need to work on both in our current district, um, we've seen movement in this, um, but we know um, it, it is the idea of um, representation. So while we're filling every seat, um, do, does our, our teaching staff look like our student population? It doesn't. And I don't think there's a way we're, that's going to happen overnight. So how do we, again, change that narrative to help um, increase in that pipeline specifically um, to get underrepresented um, minority um, representation of our, our teaching staff, our classified staff, um, in, in a place where they realize that this is a place for them. And, and then we've got to be able to help um, select them and then, and then hold on to them so they don't, they don't leave. You know, you, you talk a lot about cultivating staff and keeping them there, building culture, uh, a soliciting voice, uh, helping the districts grow. Let's talk a little bit about your leadership teams. So when you're looking to hire somebody to be part of your leadership team, give me a couple things that really are the driving force behind you saying, there's the it factor that I'm looking for. So let's talk about that. Glenn, you're up first. All right. That's a great question. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> I'm relentless when I'm looking for a new administrative team members. I actually had uh, two join us last year. Um, I, one of the greatest books I ever read when it comes to looking into um, hiring that it factor is Talent War. I don't know if you've ever had a chance to read that. Check that out. It's special services, uh, the SEAL teams on how they create teams. Um, so it's more of like a West Point, Navy SEALs combined and so forth. But it's all about you're not just filling the seat. You're filling the seat for years to come. What is, like you mentioned earlier, the legacy that you're trying to create? Do they have the vision? Do they have, like Zondra said, you know, you don't want to be the smartest person in the room. I want people who are going to push back on me. Mm. Um, you know, recently I had one of my curriculum supervisor. Uh, she's my, she's in her second year. She's phenomenal. And she kind of spoke back to me and she came to apologize later. And I was like, look, I didn't, I didn't need a shadow. You know, if I needed, I'd be like Plutarch said, you know, I can always have a shadow. The shadow never talks back to me, but I need somebody to push this to move forward. So I'm looking for a person with an incredible attitude. I'm looking for a person that knows they're not going to be successful each and every time. I want to see how they fail and get back up. Uh, part of my interviewing process, when I, I invite a board member, I have students involved. I have this associations uh, for the teachers. Um, you know, you name it, I have it in those groups of those individuals. So it's our decision. It's not just mine. Um, and then I take in the breakfast, you know, after a second or third interview, depending on what we're doing. And I purposely tell the, the waiter to screw up the order, you know, because I want to see how this individual reacts when they get the wrong thing. Because if they're a jerk to this waiter, it means they're going to be a jerk to somebody else when something screws up. And I don't need that person there. So um, we do tell them afterwards, you know, we did have the little gimmick on them. Uh, I had to pay a lot of money to the, to the diners that we had because they were so fearful of getting bad reviews. But like I said, I really wanted to see how they would treat an individual. doesn't matter what your position is. doesn't matter what your title is. I want to see how you treat a human being and how do you, adverse, you go through that adversity. So sometimes you got to put it out on them to see you can do it. That doesn't happen all the time in an interview. You can ask a bunch of different questions. And we really focus on emotional intelligence. We focus on, you know, not just the IQ test. I want to know how you react when it comes to a team and building. I want to know if you had unlimited resources, no re resources, what are you building? And I want to know um, multiple questions about you because I've already Googled you at least three times and I've already looked up all your social media pages too. So I need a leader. I need someone who's going to keep building more leaders. And that, like we mentioned earlier, I think it was Andre or Neil said the sustainability, the building of the organization that's constantly living. When I leave, how will it be better? You know, and that's where the leaders are. And, and lastly, people that work together. 
you know, that, you know, you're not going to be best friends, but I need people that can work together to come together for that common vision, that common language. And they do that. And that takes a little work on our part, too, to make that all come together. But you need that type of an attitude too to go for it. So I kind of hit on a bunch of different things. I apologize on that. But I really, really love getting great people in the seat because they make me better. They make my staff better. And most importantly, they make our kids in our district better. You had me at the breakfast thing, man. I'm stealing that. That was fantastic. Right across the board there. Zandra, you're up. I love it. Yes. Um, I think it's the difference between skill and will, right? So oftentimes when you look at somebody's resume, they look phenomenal and they have all these experience, but then you get them in the seat in their interview and they might even interview well, but then they get in the job and it's like, oof, what happened? You know? And so background checks are so important, but I will tell you, um, I've hired some administrators and I used to think, you know, this is an old scam mentality, old, old school. Of every, you have to vit, hit every ring on the ladder before you can do vice principal. You have to do this and this, and then you have to be the principal. And a lot of people in my generation kind of have that same philosophy until, you know, we, we found a candidate that, you know, was just phenomenal, but was going to need to be an intern to get his administrative credential. And in the past, we might have overlooked that person. Um, as we do with teachers who are interns that, man, they're so good, right? But they have to pass these stinking tests in each one of our states. And so I now hire for Will. Like, will you be willing to step up? Are you, you may be um, phenomenal with people. And that's the most critical piece that we've learned um, during the last few years is exactly what you said, Glenn, that emotional intelligence. Those that are still standing in seats and are still frontline administrators or in the administrator have a connection to that emotional intelligence and they know how to treat people. The relationship is important. How you lean in with, how are you before you say, okay, now let's go do this heavy cognitive lifting together. People don't do things for you if they don't trust you. And culture, as we know, will eat anything for lunch. Like if it's, you don't have that good culture, you have bad culture, forget about it. You're not going to have a successful um, place. And so when I hire, I look for, do you love on kids? Are you kind? Like any of your experiment, Glenn, are you kind to your core? And do you go the extra mile to make sure your people are cared for? Um, that's what I look for first, because I need you to be a good person. And then I start looking at, okay, now how can you move an organization? And are you a thinker that can think globally? and minutely. So do you see the big picture as well as the finite details? Or do you only look at those details and don't see where you're going in that trajectory? Super important to have you know, a temperature read on both of those. Um, and then background checks are huge. Be you know, When you talk to, you call up another colleague and they tell you the things that this person um, has done or hasn't been able to do, um, those are really important into what they're gonna bring to your organization. Um, and but. First and foremost, you have to love on kids um, to be able to do that. So that's what I look for um, in a talent. Spoken like a kindergarten teacher right there, too. That's where it starts. <laughs> yeah. Neil. Yeah. So, um, you know, we, we've all talked about the idea about collaboration and teamwork. And, you know, I really lean in for when it comes to that, you know, we use the disc learning styles inventory sort of thing. And, you know, if whatever you know about that or no, don't know about that or, you know, four quadrants sort of thing. And you're, you're somehow placed into a strength area sort of thing for it. But <clears throat> so if, if I zoom in and even if you know nothing about what I'm talking about with this disc thing, really this idea of um, it might be that we, we, somebody says like, Oh yeah, I'm a great team player. Well, the question is, is are you, you know, are you okay with that with people that may not be in your comfort zone? Like if you're the extrovert, you know, are you, do you know how to pull out, the introverts sort of thing. If you're the one that is maybe very linear, are you okay sitting down next to that person? Or, you know, you want to be very structured. Are you okay sitting next to the dreamer that, you know, might not necessarily know how to initiate something, but you definitely need that person in the room that, that thinks big and dreams big and, um, or are you frustrated with that person, but how are you embracing that person? So, you know, the, being able to kind of think through and, and noticing, um, not just if they're okay with 10 other people like them, but how would they, you know, resolve and, and, and be a part of that? Um, the second one is a communicator. Um, I do think that there's a piece when it comes to communication. And um, this is kind of that idea of like clearest kind sort of thing. So I'm not talking about, you know, how to write research papers. Um, 
But again, and it goes back to Xander, like, are you able to be clear in a kind way? Are you able to be um, direct? Um, I've, I've seen people that just don't know, you know, don't know how to say no. And so they beat around the bush and people will walk out and um, they're not, they haven't been given feedback. You know, they're, they're doing principal, eva they're doing teacher evaluations. And I go back and I read kind of what they've written and they were never clear and gave that person feedback. And that person needed the feedback, not because they were bad. We all deserve feedback that, that help, helps us to grow forward. So you can't be afraid of that. And so how are you able to do that with students and parents and staff members uh, and that sort of thing? So being able to show that prowess of um, communication skills. Um, next one I would say would be teachable. Um, I think we always ask a similar type of question of, you know, um, the, the idea of vulnerability and where's a growth area for you. And you can tell when, when their eyes kind of go in different directions of, you know, I don't know how to answer this. Should I be honest? Should I say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm the most confident person in the world. Um, but do they have a clear record? Um, I, my, I have a Friday update going out to my principals. Uh, it's already scheduled to go out for tomorrow. And in there, I've, I've written out, like, we have summer vacation plans. We, are, we, we can give you detailed vacation plans of what we're going to do. And I probably would say, what is your, what is your summer professional development? And, and that person might, the principal might say, I'm going to go to this conference. I'm going to go to this training. I'm going to go to this. But if I were to say, okay, those are things that you chose to go to, like that national conference or the state conference or the local professional development, but what's an area did you find out last year that you go, gosh, I need to go through this professional learning. I'm not quite strong in this area and I've got to do some personal growth in this area and I'm going to pick up this book or I'm going to go meet with this person individually. Did you block time for that? Like, are you in a place that you're able to say reflectively, I need to grow in this area and I want to hear what those things are. When I make those back background check phone calls, um, I've learned nobody's going to ever tell you, like, you know, you always ask the question, you know, is this person, what are this person's negatives? And they go, no, this person's the best thing since sliced bread, take them. So I switched the question and say, um, if I could send this person to a conference, what should the name of that conference be? Or what should the name of that workshop, sh workshop session be? And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. Probably classroom management, probably, you know, such and such, you know, it just kind of, you know, it, it's not, it, therefore it's kind of getting away from, not that we don't need professional development, we all do, just what is it? Um, and the last thing is, um, I'm going to say this idea about uh, just caring and, and, you know, do you care? And I'm going to leave it at that. Like, do you care about kids? Do you care about your building? Do, you know, like, are you walking by the trash sort of thing? So going back to Glenn, you know, if there's trash on the floor, are you picking it up? Or are you saying, well, gosh, we have a custodian for that. Um, or, you know, or somebody else is supposed to do that job or somebody's supposed to do, like, you know, um, if the phone call comes up and it's a wrong number, but they're asking for the weather, are you going to tell them what the weather is? Like, you know, I mean, are you still going to do that in a very kind way, but you're going to care and take that through. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, so I'd love to say that our jobs are done. Our jobs are never done. So we've got to be able to place to just care. Neil, I love you said that. One thing I wanted to add is I always say, would I want my child to be in that class? Or would I want my own kids to be with that person? Answer that question for me. You say that to the person you're asking about the other individual. It's a great question to ask because that's true to the heart. So this is a great group to ask this question to because I know that you're very active on the new platforms. But like I always say, if you're not on social media, you still rent your movies at Blockbuster. You still <laughs> buy your pants at Montgomery Wards and you still put in those beta tapes. So my question to you is this, how can we establish this format that you have right now that we're on a podcast, different parts of, look at this, New Jersey to California, Texas, Massachusetts, it's all connected within one stream. How can we keep on using this in a, as an effective tool for professional development? And part two of this question, and we'll start off with you, Glenn. Part two is what are great conferences? Tis the season, tis the season for conferences. What do you recommend for an administrator right now to use that Title I money or whatever it might be to go visit? So how can we promote podcasts such as this out there as PD and what conferences do you suggest? That's a great two questions. Um, I think first and foremost, you have to, like I think it's either Neil or Zander said, that you have to be pushing yourself forward to listen to 
other like-minded people. You have to push yourself forward to hear what's going on, no matter where you are in the country or in the world, you know, what education's going on. And I think that's where educators are guilty of only visiting two schools. And that's the one they work at. And that's the one where the kid goes to school, you know? So, you know, having the opportunity to listen to podcasts and using social media and then meeting these people and talking to these people on you know, DMs and so forth is so enlightening. I would not be where I am today without, you know, having met Zondra before, having met Neil many years ago um, in down in Florida. You know, I, I am beyond thankful that I linked up on social media and I linked up with different podcasters and so forth and got to know <laughs> even more. It helped me grow. Um, me personally, and I, I really think about what Neil just said about, you know, where do you want to grow and what conferences you want to go to. Um, coming out of COVID, it really hit me hard saying, look, you really better rock my socks or I'm not going anywhere because I'm tired of hearing the same old, same old. I'm tired of hearing about people who did not work during the pandemic tell me how to do my job, you know, because this world has changed a lot in the last three years. And I'll be honest with you, I want to hear people that are on the ground hitting it hard and, and doing great things. You know, like when someone says, hey, you know, I did this great thing in the district. Well, I'm going to ask them, like, well, how did you convince your board? How do you convince your stakeholders? And not out of 10 times, people won't be able to do that. They're just great pen and ink philosophers, and they're not actually the one to put the, the sword to the stone. So, you know, for different conferences and so forth, I'd recommend, and I can recommend a bunch, and I'm going to a bunch coming up, and I'm really excited about this, but I recommend going to visit as many school districts as you can. Go travel. Go to the conference or go to a group that's going to say, hey, we're going to go visit Zondra's district. Or we're going to go visit Neil's. Or we're going to visit Josh. Or we're going to visit Dean's or whatever it may be. We're going to go see these schools because that's where you see the true instruction going on. That's where you see the true leadership going on because I could sell you everything in the world right now and you're going to believe me. But when I get there and I talk to your teachers and I feel the second I cross that threshold in your building, it's either excitement or it's, oh my God, this is the worst school ever. And those kids, they are the best ambassadors in the world. They're going to tell you everything and anything that Miss Zandra does at her school and what she doesn't do. You know, so for me personally, like I said, I would recommend going to visit as many different schools as you can. Put yourself out there. Find different organizations that will do that. And if you're going to a national conference or a regional conference, reach out to somebody from that area and say, hey, can we come visit your school beforehand or afterwards? What, what a better resource. So that's two great things. Number one, you're seeing the school and you're meeting all these different kids and seeing all these different programs and different curriculums going on. And number two, you're building a relationship with someone who might become a great Super sister, as Zandra would say, or a super brother, um, yep. helps you out because then from there you're testing people and you know, you're DMing and saying, "Hey, I really struggled with this uh, board member or this policy," and or you know, I've done this a billion times, but how would you do it this time? You know, it it you have to have those conversations because you know we're all human. We need to talk, but we all need to grow. So that's what I would recommend. So. Uh, sorry, guys, if I didn't give any, you know, different name to different group, I'm not going to go. That's good, Glenn. And I appreciate those words. And that's very true. I never thought about that, visiting those districts. Hey, uh, Zandra and Neil, can we, we're getting close to that one hour where it automatically shuts off. So give us your thoughts right there real quick. And then we still got some closing uh, questions. So, Neil, talk to us. Podcast and conference. Me? Or me? Yes. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah, mine will take 30 seconds. So I'm also, also not going to talk about which conferences because to me, I'm not going to say it doesn't matter. I, I have some personal preferences, but I understand geography, cost of, you know, cost of districts, that sort of thing. Here's, here's would be my thing. And it's just like kind of where, where Glenn was going was it, where, wherever you go, if you go to an actual conference or workshop, my advice is you're not there just to attend, sit and gather information. Like my mind, like, I go, I go crazy when I, when I'll, people come back and I go, okay, what did you learn and who did you connect with? And they'll, they can answer the first one, but not the second one. And I'm like, you should be coming back with 50 phone numbers, um, email addresses, Twitter handles, that sort of thing. Because, and not just from the speaker, but like, who are the people you sat next to? You know, and, and I, I, I get it. Like, I'm not talking, you know, for the person to stand up on top of a desk and, and jump around and that sort of thing, but you're sitting in a session Turn to the people beside you, ask them some questions, because what's going to happen is you're going to go back to your district. Reality's going to set in where you're going to start trying to implement something and you're going to run into a roadblock. And you, you're going to say, like, how do I go through this? 
And if you don't have the ability to pick up that phone and, and call somebody, you're in trouble. People talk to me all the time about I'm on an island, I'm by myself and nobody's there. And I'm going, and I, I'm going to say this, that's your fault. There are some connected educators that are willing to give you their phone number, willing to give you their time and would be happy to do that. You just have to ask and they'll be they'll meet you more than halfway for that. So create that that um, professional learning connection. There are so many webinars right now. You could sit at home. You could sit on the beach. You could sit wherever and just jump in a free webinar over an area that, that excites you. So it doesn't always have to be looking for that company. Look for that area that you want to work with. Thank you, Zandra. Love it. Both of those. So I won't even school visits are like, oof, that's where the secret sauce is because you get to go and listen and then you can replicate with their recipe on what you want to do. So I, I echo that. And then also what you're saying about the webinars. Absolutely. So much power in that. And I love getting superintendents together for school site visits. So a couple of things that I get to do too, is I am the uh, president of CalSA in California, which is the California Association of Latin Superintendents and Administrators. So we organized our own school site visits to go and visit others that had bright spots and problems of practice that we were trying to solve. And we took people together to visit. And so that was pretty powerful because it's up and eight, uh, you know, up and down California. And a lot of boards don't like to approve out of state travel at the dais. So, you know, that's that's something sometimes we have to deal with. But there are amazing national conferences, too. But if you stay within your great state, there's so many bright spots that you can do. So I just want to echo what Glenn and Neil both said. Um, but going back to your first question about, you know, why should people watch this? Dean and Josh, y'all are really good together. <laughs> really good together. Like you have some secret sauce, just the two of you. We, when you opened up, I looked at Neil's face and Glenn's face and my face. We were like, yeah, rock on brothers. So <laughs> you, why wouldn't we watch you? So I love what you're doing. Keep doing it. Um, and I will share this link with anyone and everyone so they can watch you. Love that. That's so cool. Thank you so much for those kind words. Hey, very quickly, anybody aspiring to get to the superintendent's chair, what do you tell them? Two quick things. Zandra, go. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. Do it. There. All right. Good. Neil. So uh, begin building relationships as, as early as possible and continue realizing that relationships matter first. And then, and I think you've picked up the theme of, of this whole conversation is uh, get that group of people together. Don't don't do this on an island. You're not on an island. So find that group. Good stuff right there, Glenn. Last uh, echo on all those statements right there. Find mentors, multiple mentors that have been there, done that. That's a huge boost. And or find a reverse mentor, somebody younger than you, help you, you know, mm -hmm. learn up. And you do not know it all. And if you're the smartest person on your team, you're doing something wrong. You better have some great game changers in that room pushing you and pushing your team forward. So always have people to push you and push your team. <laughs> Josh, what do you think, man? I'm telling you right now. That's good stuff. We had the, we had the ball on the one-yard line. Ooh. These superintendents opened up the gap, did the dive up the A-gap, and it's a touchdown on the red zone. We have a touchdown today again. Another awesome show. Uh, show. Thank you for everybody being here. Sandra, Joe, Neil Gupta, Glenn Robbins, everybody. But hey, Dean, it's not over. Never it's over, not over. Josh. It's not over. Sunday. What do we have Sunday, Dean? What do we yeah, have Sunday, Flagship Dean? show, 7 p.m., Josh. Only 475 episodes have already been done. But go ahead. Tell us there more, Josh. Jason Kennedy. Jason Kennedy joining us this Sunday, 7 p.m. His motto is, let's quit teaching. What does that mean? Well, you're going to have to join and find out this coming Sunday. Thank you to all superintendents. Thank you for giving us a touchdown, and we're ready to rock it and go home. Thank you, everybody. Take it away, Dean. Hey, on behalf of Zandra, Neil, Glenn, and Josh Tova, we want to thank you all. Remember one thing out there, guys. We exist for the best interest of kids, and don't ever forget that. Don't ever let your personal beliefs get in front of that. Have a great week, everybody. Finish strong and do the best you can and be the best, best version of yourself. Everybody, hold on to the panel for one second. We'll be right with you.